Moving on. Before the Image staff worked up the courage to invite Harrison Scott Key to the Glenn Workshop and onto this podcast, and before I read his debut memoir, The World's Largest Man, I heard his voice. Whatever thing you're defensive about is the very thing you should be writing funny about. You write funny about uh, an idea or a religion or a, a way of living not to weaken it, but to strengthen it. You know, you mock, but you're trying to find the golden calf inside this, the, the, inside the temple of whatever culture you're in so you can smelt it down into gold. Yeah. Gold, yeah. Jerry, gold. I was in my car, sitting in some parking lot with the keys still in the ignition, having one of those public radio moments. Suddenly a voice reaches through your speakers and grabs you, and the traffic through your windshield feels less and less burdensome as the story unfolds. To kill the engine before the story's conclusion is frankly out of the question. Who is this voice, I wondered, and how can I hear it again? It was only after the host announced his name that I put the pieces together. That Image had published his essay, Man is But an Ass, in issue 83 of the journal, and that he was on the radar for Glenn 2017. The piece that had me laughing alone in my Volkswagen like a lunatic comes from Harrison Scott Key's debut memoir, The World's Largest Man, which earned the 2016 Thurber Prize for American Humor. And humor is indeed the first thing that comes to mind when I think about this book. But to comment only on the hilarity of this book would be to diminish its full scope and to diminish the power of humor altogether. Key is not only intent on telling us his own story about the beauty and the absurdity of his boyhood in rural Mississippi, but to explore the way that his family and the stories they told each other have deepened his love for them and for the strange land that became his home. For Key, a good whopper is a form of love, and therefore, the truest story there is. Harrison Scott Key's work has appeared in Oxford American, McSweeney's, and Issue 83 of Image Journal. He's a professor of creative writing at Savannah College of Art and Design, and he joined us this year at the Glenn Workshop to teach memoir. Well, yeah. So, I mean, your own path to memoir wasn't direct, was it? I mean, you were. we were talking last night about theater, and, and mm -hmm. you know, that was your first assumption, I think, as a writer, as a professional teacher mm -hmm. and so memoir how did that or did you always know you wanted to write that that sort of way i've been talking about myself since i was two or three um so hopefully not in the third person <laughs> sometimes in the second <laughs> um but i definitely did not you know i mean i i was born in 75 and so the the great sort of memoir uh, revolution of the 90s was happening when I was in college and I, I, I knew about it and it, and it didn't, nothing about it was interesting to me. I was reading philosophy and theology and, and reading plays and Shakespeare and Edward Albee and, and I thought I was going to be a playwright because I'm very drawn to the performance of language and, and words. And I, I was an actor, I was a terrible actor, but I, but I enjoyed it. And, and so I thought, well, if I like saying words, then being a playwright seems the most obvious path to that. And English was something, it just, where I, my undergrad, it was, there were just so many girl English majors and there were like no guy English majors. And it was just such a sort of stereotypical, Everybody talked about Jane Austen, and I was like, I don't, that's not my jam. I just didn't feel like my, you know, my world. And I never really felt like I fit in the theater community either. I've, I, I enjoyed the, the philosophy majors, I think, more than anything, and ended up hanging out with them more. Um, but in, to, to, to answer your question, when I was in, when I just finished my PhD in playwriting, and what I learned in that program was that I didn't really enjoy playwriting, um, that unless I was going to move to New York, I was probably going to end up teaching and, you know, directing a musical every spring for the next 40 years, and then I would die. <laughs> and I just, I didn't want that. I just, I thought, how have I gotten, like, railroaded into this career path? I'd just gotten married, and, and I thought, how do I write, and, and how can I share my stories with other people, not just in writing, but in, in performing and in, in reading at, at, uh, in public? How could I do that? And then I just thought, well, why, why don't I just write books? And I read 
uh, we were talking last night. I read Good Man is Hard to Find again um, during that time. And I thought, man, this feels like what I want to write. It was so immediate. You know, I, I felt like I was hearing uh, the, the writer uh, as she's thinking and writing these stories. I thought that's what I want to do. And so I tried to write fiction for a long time. I tried to write a book called A Confederacy of Dunces, but that one has been written already. So <laughs> yeah. about halfway through that, I, I was living in New Orleans too. Oh, wow. And, and I was really channeling Ignatius and, and Tool and trying to write something like that. And I remember uh, I was telling a friend, I was, you know, getting up early. I was, I was writing grants at Tulane University. I left the theater and left teaching and I was just writing and, you know, trying to earn a living. And it was honestly, it was really sad. I got paid twice as much to write grants at a university as I did to teach at a university. And I know that, you know, supply demand, that's how things work, but it was so wild that that's the case. And so it's to everybody else, it seemed like a demotion. Like I was somehow going from a, you know, professor to some menial, uh, you know, clerk, but with the, with the increase in salary, I thought, well, I can do this menial job and then I can get up early and write. And I was trying to write novels and I was talking to a friend of mine and, and, you know, so many of my stories were touched on things that had happened to me in real life. I was writing about, you know, a young boy who was trying to kill his first deer. I was writing about, um, other I mean, characters who were similar to me or in similar situations or people from the South who had, who had grown up where I grew up. And I was talking to a friend and I was telling her about my stories. And she said, this is an old college friend. And she said, well, I was like, what should I write? You know? And she said, I don't care what you write, but it should be as funny as the stories you tell about your dad. And I was like, you know, that just seemed like all these funny stories I would tell about my family sitting on, you know, somebody's front porch or around a campfire, those just seemed um, like, well, that's what everybody does. Everybody's got stories they tell. You know, I, I first didn't realize that not everybody sits around on the porch and tells stories. They watch TV or play video games, but they don't do that. But, you know, in the South, I sort of assume, well, everybody's a great storyteller who's wildly funny and mm -hmm. loves to make everybody laugh. I mean, sitting around the the dinner table, you know, uh, after Sunday lunch growing up, you know, everybody told stories and whoever had the best voices, you know, and could entertain. And when you're the youngest and I was the youngest for a long period of time and in, in my extended family, I had to find a way to entertain everybody to keep them listening. And so um, she was like, as long as it's as funny as those stories you tell about your dad. And, I, and that stuck with me. And I kept trying to write short stories and novels. And I thought, maybe I should write some of those stories down. I just started doing it. And you know, one after another, then I would write some random, you know, I wrote this novella about an armadillo <laughs> named Atwood. And I would, I could, pro I would probably, you know, be a multimillionaire now if I just turned it into a TV show or a board book for children or something. But I spent so much time working on this stupid novel about an armadillo who, um, should we, should I stop talking? No. Um, and, you know, so I, I, then I wrote a, a 25,000 word novella about a unicorn in the Garden of Eden. Um, and, and then I would, I'd be like, why am I doing this? And so, I would, you know, and I, and I would I'd write some little story about my dad, some, some memory that I had. And then I'd give all these pieces to, you know, friends at the college where I was, where I was at, by this time I was in Savannah at SCAD um, writing speeches for the president and doing other sorts of writing for the university. And I, you know, met other writer friends there and I'd give them, I'd give them stories and be like, what'd you think about the armadillo story? That was pretty good, huh? And they're like, um, not, not really, but the story about your dad, you know, a lot of emotional depth there. And I'm like, I just, I was trying to write funny. And so when people told me that the story had emotional depth, that's not what I wanted to hear. Like, I was just trying to make people laugh. And so I, the point is I ignored that urge to write memoir. I really resisted it for a long period of time. To me, uh, because of what, what I saw happen in the 90s with memoir, it just it felt so self-indulgent. And because I had nothing tragic had ever happened to me, I didn't feel like I had a right to write memoir. And uh, eventually I came around and I realized that somehow those stories are what people reacted to when I gave them you know, a story about a unicorn, or an armadillo, or my dad. People didn't like the other two, and so I just started writing more and more of those. And that was probably, but when that when that happened, when I realized, oh, I'm writing memoir. This is a book about my life. That was it's 2017. 
that was probably in 2009 when that happened. So it's been a while. Yeah, when I when you talk about writing funny, I, I mean obviously comedy is one of our favorite things to consume in this world and it goes down easy, but when I think about trying to write funny, trying to be comic, I'm terrified. I mean, it feels to me like it's it's easier to fail at comedy than it is at drama. <laughs> and and uh, I'm I'm just guessing that this was something that just grew out of your life. I'm just guessing that the way your family life evolved, you became the funny guy. Am I right? Or mm -hmm. am I, did, did you sort of pick it up along the way? I mean, I think I've always been a cut up, you know, always got bad marks in behavior a little bit. I talk a lot. I remember in fourth grade, my teacher overhearing my teacher tell my mother that I would talk to a telephone pole. And I thought, I think that's an insult. But then I thought, I'm, I might do that. I might <laughs> talk to a telephone pole. Who? Why wouldn't you? Um, I can remember my dad, you know, told me a, a story about um, once he, he came to, to my school. I think I was in first grade. He'd come a couple times for, you know, um, your dad comes to, you know, like eat dinner, eat lunch with your parents today or whatever. Um, but one time he came and, and how he said, you, he said, you were just, you know, you were, you were just making everybody laugh. And he was, he was sort of like, and I, and he said, and he said this not long before his death. Um, he's like, yeah, he's like, you were just cutting up, man. And you, you know, you had everybody giggling and you were doing faces and voices and stuff. And I don't remember like thinking, I'm the funny guy, I'm gonna be funny. That's that's just me behaving according to my nature. Um, so I guess a lot of it, a lot of that is just how, just how I made. Um, but I definitely, it's also what, I, I mean, it's also what people react to. So, you know, my brother was a, he was tall and, you know, I looked up, he was three years older than me and he was very tall and he was a, he was, I really looked up to him and he was really good at hunting and sports. And my dad was such a, a masculine uh, presence. And so probably a lot of that humor, be, I began to attempt or to use unconsciously to use humor as a sort of way to, you know, that was my thing. Um, if I could, you know, if my brother could, you know, hit a home run and my dad could, you know, kill a, you know, a bull elk and I can make everybody laugh. That was my, that was sort of my talent. And I'm sure that that began to emerge more and more as I got older, um, realizing that that was sort of one of my things. But it's also, I mean, it was just like saying the thing that I, that I was thinking. And, you know, I used to make up, I, you know, I loved Weird Al Yankovic and Mad Magazine when I was a kid. You know, I'd sneak, you know, I'd, I, I didn't have to sneak, but I, we wouldn't buy the Mad Magazine, but I'd do the fold over in the back, you know, every time, as soon as we got to the grocery store, I'd go do that. And occasionally I would, I would buy a cracked magazine, didn't understand half of what was happening, but clear, there was just something in the satire that just, it really, it was like a keyhole into my mind. I just loved it. And so, you know, I've always, I think I've just always been, um, partial to jokes and humor and funny things, funny movies, and the process of getting there, you know, a lot of people are funny. I mean, you know, I've heard you speak several times. You're funny when you talk, you know, it's, it's on accident, but, um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, um, you know, a lot, lots of, you know, lots of people are funny, especially intelligent people, um, uh, you know, know how to use wit and irony when they talk or write. That's not unusual to be a funny person. Um, I found that getting from being a funny person to writing funny was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, uh, intellectually. It was I so mean, there difficult. is craft involved, right? I mean, it's not just purely spontaneous. There's, there's a way to tell a story mm -hmm. and, and just certain forms of knowing how to use bathos or mm -hmm. rep re repeated language that you kind of play on a term until it kind of hits pay dirt. I don't know, but there's craft too. Well, yeah, there is. And I think, so, like, I remember, you know, the movie Top Gun came out in 1986, and You've Lost That Love and Feeling was a big part of that movie. And so I, that summer, you know, that song was all over the radio. 
and I made up a version called You've Lost That Bloated Feeling. And it was, a, it was like a commercial <laughs> for a man who was in love with his acid reflux. I was, I was 11 at the time. And so before I knew about like technique or craft, like I knew that if you just take that the word, like the word bloated replacing lovin', well, they're both the same syllables. So, you know, the same number of syllables. So when you, when you say it, it, it flows with the song. And so there was something about that that, that was pleasing to me. When I was younger, I, I would, I still do this sometimes, and I guess some people would say that it's a, a, a sort of compulsive behavior, but I would, when I would hear phrases, when I would read billboards, I would, I would count it out on my fingers and try to get to, um, to 10 syllables or five feet of I am's. Um, just because I had, you know, 10 fingers. And so, you know, I would read in like, um, you know, you know, um, down at the fairgrounds later this weekend, down at the fairgrounds later this weekend. Oh, that was 10. That was good. And, and if it wasn't, if it wasn't perfectly 10, I would repeat it until it, it was divisible by 10, which is totally strange. Everybody's a weirdo. Everybody has stuff like that, I'm sure. But but I was always interested in sort of how words, like the rhythm of words. And, um, and I think that's, that's a natural uh, sort of talent that you need to build a good punchline. Um, but there is, an, there is an element of craft involved that when I started really seriously trying to write funny, I just started studying funny books. And, you know, I would study funny scripts and I bought all the Seinfeld scripts and try to figure out like because it's so magical I mean a funny story a funny scene so elevates you out of yourself and into this sort of this joyful fugue state of laughter that you know maybe it lasts for two seconds or maybe it lasts for a minute think of the great funny movies that you love and so like deconstructing it seems impossible like how do you you know how do you recreate the feeling of riding your bike home from school on the last day? How do you recreate that feeling? Like, it seems so impossible. And, and so write, intentionally writing funny, like I'd be reading, you know, I'd be watching Seinfeld or, or reading the scripts or watching Groundhog Day or reading, you know, when Ignatius is writing his letters to his readers in Confederacy of Dunces. And they're so funny. And so to break it down and to think, well, how did he do that? seemed impossible because it, it, it just seemed like, how do you, you know, it just I, it seemed impossible. So I just started to study funny books and I really went on a journey um, to find other funny books. And I would go to the bookstore and um, I write about this a little bit in my next book. I'd go to bookstores and be like, I, I want to see your funny books. And sometimes they would show me, you know, um, sometimes they would show me Flannery O'Connor and I'm like, yeah, but not that, you know, <laughs> like, really, you think this is funny? And of course it's funny and it's comedic in this really metaphysical sense. But like, I wanted something that made me laugh, like when I read Confederacy. And I mean, I can't tell you how many books I bought and hated because, you know, if it said laugh out loud, funny on the back, it's, it was just guaranteed not to make you laugh out loud. And, and I just studied all these books and I would listen to funny scenes and movies and then try to figure out, like, was it something about the cadence of the language? And then I started studying um, classical figures of speech because I was teaching English composition at SCAD at the time. And I was using these in my comp classes. And I realized, like, so many of the classical figures of speech are sort of punchline blueprints. So um, you have, I mean, of course, you've got irony. That's one of the figures. But you also have, you know, antithesis. I mean, you know, just about any good Woody Allen quote is some form of antithesis. Um, and then I started looking at Twitter and, and, and seeing like, oh, these got the, like the funniest tweets follow the same form. So usually some sort of incongruity or some sort of a flip or a um, misdirection. I think that's called paraprosdokian. I think that's the name of misdirection. When you think I'm going to say this and I'm going to end up over here. And so I really just started, and I started tweeting around that time, and I was a terrible tweeter, and I still am. Um, but it was a way for me to try to figure out how to write funny in that short space. And so that helped me a little bit write funny, but it still didn't feel organic or natural. It felt a little forced. And honestly, I mean, I can go back to, to my first memoir, 
And I can see moments where I'm like, I don't think I'd have written it like quite like that, but I was just trying. I was trying to use all the tools that I had at my disposal. And then there's a kind of humor writing that's up beyond that. And I would, pro- I would say like Charles Portis, who's the, the best exemplar of this, which is, it's so quiet and it's so subtle and it doesn't seem funny unless you're, unless you're sort of in the right space for it. And there's no technique. It's just character. It's just, there's a little bit of uh, dramatic irony um, in that, you know, you've got a character who's a little dumber than you are, or that you know, you just know a little bit more of what's going on than the characters do, but there are no like word tricks to it. Um, at least not apparently. And I'm, I, I'd love to be at that. I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get to a place where I don't have to rely on techniques and little triplets and things like that. Yeah. Well, um, given that we're, this is Image Journal and uh, we have this focus on intersection of art, faith, and mystery, um, I'm curious about how have you found trying to write about religious experience, religious belief? I mean, the obvious way to go is to make fun of it because there's so much bizarre looney tune religion in America and it's not that hard to kind of, you know, let it let it more or less hoist itself by its own petard and I'm sure you you've grown up with, you know, a lot of stuff that probably deserved that. Um but you know, I know you're a person who cares about these larger questions. So how have you kind of evolved in your way of, of trying to be funny about those kinds of issues? Well, you know, humor will cover a multitude of sins. Um, and you can, if you can write funny, you can sort of talk about anything. I was very, um, I was reluctant when I first began writing in graduate school um, around 2000 and I was in a secular pro- playwriting program that was secular. And so, um, and this was, you know, this was around 2000, the culture wars were still kind of hot at that time. And so, um, you know, anytime in, in the, the other people in the program, most of them weren't writing about the South or thing or sort of conventional Orthodox Southern issues. And so whenever religion entered their pieces, um, it was always very intentionally to attack it or to to show how it was false or faulty on some level, Um, which, of course, like it's faulty on a lot of levels. Like what I realize is that I understand way more about how faulty it is than people outside of religion. And one thing I I tell my students is that... um, they have to learn how to make fun of their own tribe first and make fun of themselves. And then we know we build sort of a draw concentric circles on the board. You know, you start with you and then you've got your family and then the ring out outside of that is your, your community or your tribe. And we belong to many tribes. You know, you've got the writer tribe and there's a lot of things you can make fun of, you know, about writers. And then you've got the college professor tribe, which overlaps a little bit, but that's different. And then you've got the people you go to church with or the people who live on your street and so um, when I realized that, like when people would mock, they would, they would be, you know, mocking the church um, in an essay or in a, in, a, um, in a play or in a monologue, and I'd realize like, no, 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 that's not how you do it. Let me show, let me show you how to mock religion. And I realized that, that it's always funnier when you start with yourself. And so, you know, I had that, it took me a lot, I had that realization over many, many years And so, you know, I mean, I was just writing out of experience and, you know, I grew up going to church three times a week, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, um, and, you know, driving 30 minutes into town to go to church and realizing that whatever your life experience is, like, that's where you're going to find your humor. And so there was a time when I thought, well, I can't mock religion. I mean, especially when the culture wars felt like they were sort of, you know, in full rage I can't mock religion because I'm, I should defend that and because that's what I believe and that's what I think is good. And I think what I believe helps make our nation and our world better. Why would I ever mock it? And so, you know, whatever, the, whatever thing you're defensive about is the very thing you should be writing funny about. Um, that you, you, you write funny about uh, an idea or a religion or a, a way of living 
not to weaken it, but to strengthen it. You know, you mock, but you're trying to find the golden calf inside this, the, the, inside the temple of whatever culture you're in. Um, so you can smelt it down into gold, yeah. gold, yeah. Jerry, gold. I, <laughs> I often think of someone like Evelyn Waugh, who, who had a really anarchic personality and he probably spoke to telephone poles in his time too. <laughs> But he had this drive for order too. He sort of wanted, um, he wanted to kind of deconstruct things in order to kind of show what was missing, what, mm -hmm. you know, to reveal beneath the chaos of modern life that the, the forms of moral, political, spiritual order that people had forgotten, fallen away from. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's one of the trickier things about, you know, yes, yeah, starting with yourself makes sense. That that makes me think of Walker Percy, you know, who wrote this, among other things, this novel, uh, Love in the Ruins, which mm -hmm. is about the culture wars. Mm -hmm. And the subtitle of that is The Adventures of a Bad Catholic Sometime Near the End of the World. <laughs> and of course, by by giving us a character who's a bad Catholic, he can give us someone who's both human and therefore not holier than now and kind of killing the humor with pomposity, but at the same time um, with a theological perspective that can actually see some of the kind of lunacies of, of and just, you know, kind of stupidities in some ways of, of the secular people who think they're so sophisticated. But mm -hmm. so I don't know where that leads us, but. Well, you know, I wrote, well, here's an example. So you know, there was a time, I mean, I, you know, I, I grew up in a very conservative evangelical home and culture in Mississippi. I mean, you're conservative and evangelical in Mississippi, whether you like it or not. Like, that's just what you're living in. If, you, if you're not going to be that, you have to intentionally try and not be that just because of the culture. And, and then I, you know, went to a Presbyterian college, um, which is a sort of whole story in and of itself. Um, I mean, basically to my, to my family, it was as though I had moved to, um, to Morocco or Haight-Ashbury to go from the Church of Christ to a Presbyterian college, even though the founder of the Church of Christ, Alexander Campbell, was a Presbyterian minister. Um, and I sort of got plugged into the culture wars there with guys like Francis Schaeffer and sort of, you know, the, you know, the hegemonies of postmodernism. And so I really did believe that I was supposed to be writing pieces, whatever I was going to write, if I was going to do monologue or if I was going to have a band um, and I was in a band for a while, if I was going to do that or be in plays or write books, that I had to ad advance the, the, the front in the culture war, that I had to show how the other side was wrong and stupid and that how we were right and that ultimately the people who were wrong would go, thank you so much for showing us how we were wrong. You were right. We are now on your side. I mean, I had that mentality in college and it, it, that felt like what I was supposed, that felt like that was my duty. I, I, but whenever I'd get up on stage, I would completely not, I would, I wasn't advancing any cause for Jesus or anybody else. I mean, something else took over when I got on stage, but I felt like that was my calling. And whenever I wasn't writing anything that didn't feel like it was advancing a worldview agenda, I felt like I had failed and I had disappointed other people in the church and, and my professors and things. And so, for example, I wrote a play, you know, I, I remember in college I read Inherit the Wind and I thought, damn these people, you know, like I've got to, I've got to write a play that is mocking because I did, I did see just through reading the sort of, um, faux sophistication of, of the materialist worldview. Like I, I firmly believed I'm like, gosh, you know, materialism, um, is, can account for even less than the sort of vitalism that I believe. And I wanted, so I thought, well, I'm going to write a sort of counter to, to inherit the wind. And I was going to call it new world monkeys because that's a phrase <laughs> that they use in the play. And, and I thought there's, there's going to be a trial and it's going to be, it's going to be a man who is teaching creationism in the public school and he'll be on trial. And it was, and it's, and a lot of it, well, it's not a terrible idea. It's a great title, by the way. New World Monkeys. I still, you have got to use that somewhere. I still, I still want to use that Copyright title. Harrison Scott Key. All rights reserved. <laughs> While supplies last. Um, and I, 
I, and I couldn't write that play. I just, I, cause I, I wanted it to be funny because then the, the sort of like joyful, chaotic, anarchic, creative spirit inside me desperately wanted it to be funny. And, but then my head, the worldview warrior inside me wanted it to be persuasive and I could never write that play. And the way to, I mean, the, the, if I want to attack, um, you know, what, you know, Sam Goldwyn say, if you have a message, send Western Union or use Western Union. I mean, I sort of feel that way now. You know, if I really want to show the idiocy of scientific materialism, then I should just write something for first things. Or, you know, I I mean, it would be fun and it could maybe even be a very entertaining essay. Um, But I I really struggled with the sort of, I'm not going to say legalistic, the sort of the, the, what's the word? combative, argumentative. I want to, I was so infatuated with ideas and, and how powerful they could be and how, how I had been hoodwinked in the culture for so long about so many things that I really, I, 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 there was a fight between my head and my heart and my head wanted to, it wanted to show how certain ideologies and worldviews were, um, damaging, hurtful, secretive, manipulative, but then the artist in me really just wanted to, you know, come up with funny lyrics for songs. And, and there was some, there was truth in there. And ultimately I just, I went with my heart, you know, I started, I just wanted to write stories that made people laugh. And I thought, well, if I can do that, um, then maybe I can say something truthful while I'm doing that. Um, but that, even that didn't quite work. And it wasn't until I just fully committed to just trying to write something that brought joy to people that was using my own experience in the church and in, you know, Christian higher education. Like, so now if I'm going to write a funny play, it's going to be making fun of Christian higher education. That's the funny play I can write. And if, you know, if I'm going to write, if I'm going to be, um, if I'm going to, you know, write funny about the church, I mean, well, if I'm going to, you know, I mean, I've run out of material about my family. I got to write about something else. And so I, I, you know, I'm definitely going to have to, I think, start writing about faith issues more explicitly, just because if I write any more about my wife, she's going to leave me. (laughs) Oh man. Well, no, I think you're right. I think, you know, I think there's a a saying that, you know, civil wars are, are the most vicious kind of wars, but at the same time, civil wars are sometimes the most, um, when they're kind of internal wars, when they're psychic wars, um, when you battle with your upbringing, with your people, I just think that 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 generally brings up more truth, truthiness, mm-hmm. and and wisdom than just um, going after the other side. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I think of these writers we've talked about: O'Connor, Percy, John Kennedy, Toole. They all had this way of kind of fusing self-criticism along with their their larger criticism of the culture at large. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the secret of, of, even if it's kind of subtle and balanced within this, you know, artifice of this short story. So, you know, good country people, Holga is, yes, she's this modern Heideggerian, but she's also Flannery, right? She's mm-hmm. this lonely, unmarried, you know, intellectual woman stuck in the South. And right. that fusion is what allows O'Connor to both kind of attack nihilism in modern thought, and but also kind of keep it honest to mm-hmm. kind of a human situation that's really her own. Well, the fact that Holga has a very human desire for love, right? Like I, that's something I couldn't, that's why I couldn't write that play, you know, about evolution. Um, because I was, you know, I was looking at people as just vessels for ideas. And and I honestly, I saw that in graduate school. I mean, in the sort of pluralist postmodern, um, classrooms that I was in, in performance studies and, and in playwriting that, that a lot of those students and professors and really great people, and many are still friends, they they also just looked at people as vessels for ideas and they were also writing things that were, you know, hitting you over the head with a, with a worldview. Um, so I saw that on that side too. And I think in some ways that's what woke, woke me up to it. I was like, Oh, they're doing the same thing about, about me or about my people. Um, but yes, if you inf- can infuse, you know, the, the, um, the atheist, 
uh, nihilist with a burning desire for human affection such that she will climb into a hayloft and remove her leg, like then you've got a human story, right? And so, um, you know, I guess I'm not saying that uh, you're only going to be attacking yourself and your people and your worldview. Um, it's very, it's totally okay to make, make jabs at lots of different worldviews, but it, it, you definitely, you earn your ethos and you earn your credibility by looking in the mirror long and hard first. And I felt like ultimately with, with my memoir, The World's Largest Man, that the key to getting into that book and, and, and cr coming up with a book and realizing what, I, what it was about and what I should be writing is that I knew I was going to look long and hard at my family and by extension Mississippi and the South as a whole and, and say everything good and true and ugly and beautiful about them that I could because I was tired of defending the South. I was tired of explaining it to people and tired of, you know, when you're a white guy from Mississippi, you sort of have to like stand in defense of racism somehow. And, um, you know, people would ask like, you know, uh, I, I can remember, you know, I, I was in Chicago and somebody saw my Mississippi license plate and, you know, we started, he asked me where I was from and we started talking. He's like, well, you know, Mississippi, that's full of racists, isn't it? I said, it is, <laughs> and some of us can juggle too, you know, like there's, <laughs> you know, but like how, like I'm not, like you want me to defend that? What do you, you know, like I can't do that. So, um, but I, the book, that that book was the key to it was realizing I needed to make fun. I, I can make fun of the South better than somebody from Chicago can. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And through it, I'll actually learn about the South. I'll learn it uh, and I'll m maybe even purge some of the demons that I have with it. Now, you notice that I, I haven't asked you any questions about that book, in part because as we were talking last night, you, you, know, you reminded me just how intense the whole book tour and the PR for that book. Of course, it won the Thurber Prize. And I just thought, I'm not going to have him do the standard interview on the world's largest man. But what I will do and maybe ask our readers for is maybe instead of that, you could give us a little bit of a sneak preview of the new book if that's allowed. I know you might be superstitious about it or have maybe, you know, contracts that force you to kill me if you say anything about it. But could you tell us about the next book or no? Um, I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's about... Um, my childhood on a planet called Tatooine. <laughs> and uh, I desperately wanted to go to the academy and learn how to be a pilot like my father before me. Um, so we don't really have a title for it yet. We kind of have a title, but I don't want to, I, 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 I won't share that because that might change. But it you is. Couldn't, you couldn't make New World Monkeys work, could you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really, it's really got a nice ring to it. it. When I say it in the room, it sort of, it echoes around the room in a pleasing oh, way. Oh, yeah. Um, so it is, it's a, an autobiographical story. It's, you know, um, it's a memoir. It's not, you know, I'm not retelling the story of my childhood or the story of my marriage or anything. You know, I, as I tell my students, you know, a memoir is just, a, you know, a slice of the pie of your experience. It's not an autobiography. It's not an autobiography. It's not the whole pie. It's just a slice. And this is a, a different slice of my life. Something I didn't talk a lot about in the first book. It's really about... Um, how I decided to be what I was going to be when I grew up uh, and how anybody decides that. Um, it's how I decided that I wanted to write a book and get rich and famous writing a book. And it would be a funny book. And I went home one day and I you know, told my wife I wanted to write a book and she said, okay. I could have told her that I wanted to hang glide over the Golden Gate Bridge and she would have said, that's fine, <laughs> because she wouldn't have believed me. And I don't know if she believed me when I told her. And the book is really about the journey of how that happened, how my dream came true. And it did. I mean, I lived, I am living the American dream of, you know, I'm a, I took the harder road of becoming an artist and, um, not pursuing uh, jobs that would pay very well. And somehow I was able to write a book and get an agent and have a family 
and not destroy them. And the dream almost destroyed my family several times. I mean, it's very difficult to abandon my wife and children at 5 a.m. every morning so, you know, I could go right before work. And I had so many people on tour say, how did you do it? You know, and, and it, that you, you get these questions at conferences too. How did you do it? How did you write a book? How did you get an agent? It, it seems so impossible. Any sort of dream. You know, how, do you, how, did you, how did you become a player for the NFL? How did you, you know, cut a record and, you know, get on TV with your band? All that stuff seems so impossible because there are 10,000 things that you do to get there. And you can't see through that maze. You can see maybe three steps you know, beyond, but not all 10,000. And I got the question so much that I want, I just wanted to write a book that was the kind of book I needed 10 years ago. Well, here's how I did it. You're like, how did I get an agent? Well, this is how I did it. How did I get published? Well, I stood up during a Q and A at the Savannah book festival and Mark Smirnoff, the editor of the Oxford American was doing a talk and I confronted him with my story and like a complete idiot. And I should have been sent out of town on a rail, but somehow he published it. And I, you know, I wanted to tell those stories to, for my students. I wanted to write the book for my children, um, because one day they're, they're going to, we have, we speak in the language of dreams. You know, I work at a college and, you know, it's an art school and, and students come there to live their dream. And we talk about, you can be anything you want to be, you know, army posters on the classroom wall when I'm in fifth grade, be all you can be. And, but what, how do you know if you've been too much of it? How do you know when you've been enough? <laughs> and I was the salutatorian. I was, I had a college scholarship. I was voted most likely to succeed by all accounts. Like if anybody was equipped to succeed, I mean, I had both of my parents, we didn't have a lot of money and I didn't go to an amazing private elite school, but I had both of my parents and both of my arms and both of my legs and I was fully equipped to, to succeed. And it was so difficult. It was so hard to see my dream to reality. And I mean, it was just a stupid book. <laughs> and, you know, I, and I, I, I got paid a lot of money for it. And I talk about that in the new book, how much I got paid and what I did with the money and how much I paid in taxes. Uh, I know Willie Nelson stories here. I want to be, be cool with the government. And then where I went on tour and then how I was famous and then not famous and then famous again in my mind <laughs> and, <laughs> and how it was just, it was like, it was like God was a gorilla and I was just a little, I was, I was the little boy that fell into the cage and this gorilla really hurt the little boy. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was smitten constantly by my own hubris and pride on tour. Um, and yet it was, how glorious. I mean, I, I spoke, I, I read one of my stories at the, uh, the War Memorial Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee, where the Grand Ole Opry started. And I'm in this historic theater and I'm reading this story. And it was funny. It was so funny. And I was so happy and people were laughing. 2,000 people can fit in this arena or this, this auditorium. There were about 20 people there. So that's upsetting on some level. <laughs> and yet I'm here and somehow I'm here and I'm reading and people paid money to come in and see this. And so I really lived my dream and it was both glorious and completely humbling and humiliating. And ultimately I, I changed as a person because of it and feel like I have gone through a great sort of wilderness and trial. And I'm sort of on the other side of it now, you know, that I'm not really touring the book anymore. I'm occasionally do events like the Glenn workshop and I'll, I'll speak here and there, but I'm not really promoting it. I'm trying, I'm waiting for this next book to come out to tell that story. So it's a prequel and a sequel. <laughs> and I don't know if there's a name for that. We'll have to come up with a name. Nice. I just told you way more than I wanted to tell you, well, but now you know. We can always cut it afterwards if no, you know, no, it's to if I, your I, publisher's going to come after It's us. good practice. It's yeah. good practice to talk, learn how to talk about it. Cool. Well, you know, it's been great. I, 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 I want to wrap up, if at all possible, and you've been very generous with your time. <clears throat> Do you have like a little, I see some paper clips in the books you've brought. Is there just like a little scene let of mm. your own writing? Because we've been talking around it and not everyone necessarily knows it yet. I didn't, I didn't bring this here to bring a copy of my book to read it, but 
since you asked nicely. Oh, thank you. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I could read you... Hmm. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll read. I, I read this almost everywhere I go. This was the first thing that I wrote uh, in the book. When I wrote this, I knew that I had a book. I knew that it was going to be amazing and that I was going to be independently wealthy. <laughs> this, like, that's how good writing this passage made me feel. I've been trying to write funny for a long time. And, you know, this ties in well with what we were talking about earlier with um, writing about your own people and not attacking people that you don't really know. And that happened. It just came together in this little passage. It's very short. This is from chapter two of the book. This funny thing happens when people ask where I'm from, especially when I'm at academic conferences where people are so often from uninteresting places. Mississippi, I say. Oh, wow, they say. I can tell they've never seen a real live racist before, or at the very least someone who's related to a racist or has seen one in the wild. It's exciting for them. They want to tweet it. They want to write a memoir about it. So, they say, what's Mississippi really like? I can tell what they really want to ask is, what was it like to grow up around crazy people who believe that whatever can't be shot should be baptized? But they are afraid to ask because they are not yet sure if I am one of those people. I am, kind of. Not really. Sometimes. I do believe in the power of Jesus and rifles, but to keep things interesting, I also believe in the power of NPR and the scientific method. It is not easy explaining all this to educated people at cocktail parties, so instead I tell them that it was basically just like Faulkner described it, meaning that my state is too impoverished to afford punctuation, that I have seen children go without a comma for years, that I've seen some families save their whole lives for a semicolon. When I wrote that, and it was a little longer, it was, you know, but twice that long with other details that got cut out. But when I wrote that, especially the line of, uh, I believe in the power of Jesus and rifles, but also NPR and the scientific method. So this is a way for me to talk about, to sort of hint at faith. Now, you, when you read that, you don't think, oh, he must be a Christian. But you, but you think, well, maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm using these words, but in a completely safe way for everybody. But when I wrote the line about um, my state is too impoverished to afford punctuation, I was like, oh, that's, that's good. That felt exactly like what I had been trying to write. It was so it was such a surprise because you think my state is, is too impoverished to afford what? Uh, funding education, um, health insurance. You know, there are so many things that you could put there. And yet the word punctuation hints at that. It suggests that when I read that at the Mississippi Book Festival, last summer, when I got to the line of too impoverished to afford punctuation, I got a standing ovation before I was even finished. So people ask, like, what does Mississippi think about all this? I mean, these people stood up and applauded, and it was so touching. I mean, you know, of course, I was exultant and, and smiling and, and was loving it, but I almost started weeping because, like, they got it, and it was truth. I mean, so, so I, had, I was trying to write truth, all these years, I was trying to assault the world with, with truth to, to enlighten it. And in this humor, I said something so much truer than I could have said in an argument and said it in such a way that it brought joy to people and to me. I mean, I, I laugh every time, I, in, inside at least, every time I read that. And, and that's how it happened. It was through humor that I was able to, to speak truth to the world. And it's such a blessing to do it. And it's so hard. And I don't think it gets any easier um, but I, I do get better at knowing when it's not funny. And so that's nice to be yeah. growing a little bit. Well, we hope you continue to, to struggle with that, uh, that hard but necessary task because uh, it enriches us all. Um, Harrison, Scott, Key, thank you for joining us on the Image Podcast. Thank you, sir. This has been an amazing experience. Thanks again for listening to the Image Podcast. Don't forget you can subscribe to the journal and pick up the amazing Flannery O'Connor exclusive journal entry from her college years by going to imagejournal.org slash subscribe.